Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hope all is well. Hope everyone's doing all right. Hey, hey, hey. All right. So hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope you ready to get this one started, this week started. Um, let's see. We left off. Yeah, we knocked out one three, I believe. So it looked like we're getting into one four. Um, any general concerns, questions before we get rolling? Everybody good? Everybody straight? All right. All right. All right, so we're looking at 1.4 today. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to start off, uh, do a little in 1.5, maybe, maybe not, but we know most definitely we're gonna knock out 1.4 complex numbers. So, um, don't remember what we did in this class, but whenever you're taking the square root of a negative, um, before you're, you tap into imaginary or complex numbers, you will write not a real number. Well, here's where we get into what that actually means. So we do have imaginary numbers, um, and that happens or that occurs whenever you take the square root of a negative value. So the square root of negative one will be represented by I. So it doesn't completely just disappear. It's just represented by this italicized I. And that's my best way of writing it. <laughs> but of course, it looks better in the book or in um, my math lab. So that's the italicized I. Um, square root of negative one will be represented by that. So when you take the square root of 25, that's, that's five because five times five is 25, all right? And then same thing happens when you take the square root of 81, that's going to be nine because nine times nine is 81. Square root of 121 is 11 because 11 times 11 gives you 121. So whenever you take the square root of something, you want to ask yourself what times itself twice will give you that number. Now, when you look at the square root of a negative 25, there's no real number that when you multiply it times itself, twice will give you a negative number. So, you know, when we look at negative five times negative five, that's a positive 25, all right? And so if you look at over here, we always want the positive representation of that number, but we easily could have said that this answer was negative five because negative five times negative five is also 25. So there is not a number times itself twice that will give you a negative 25. So the way we represent the square root of negative 25 is by looking at it this way. Now you don't have to do the breakdown every single time, but I'm just breaking it down so you'll see how you will be processing it. Square root of 25 and then square root of negative one, square root of 25 is I, I mean square root of 25 is five. Then the square root of negative one, like we mentioned, will be represented by I. So whenever you take the square root of a negative, there should be an I in your final representation of that answer. Same thing happens with the square root of negative 81. That would be 9i, and then the square root of negative 121 would be 11i. All right, so whenever you have a negative under that radical, you should be looking at incorporating i. All right, well, I say negative under that square root. Okay. All right, any questions before I scroll up? Any problems? All right, so if we had the square root of 18 and we wanted to break it down further or take the square root of it, uh, make that expression as simple as possible. We know it's not a perfect square. All right, somebody trying to get in, where are we at? Okay, I think I need to reboot my computer too. So looking at the square root of 18 is not a perfect square. But what I can do is break it up into numbers or to two numbers wherein I can take the square root of at least one of those numbers, one of those factors. And so when I look at the factors of 18, that's one times 18, two times nine, three times six, I wouldn't break it up into three times six because I cannot take the square root of three or six. But what I would do is break it up to two times nine so that I can take the square root of nine, square root of nine is three, and then I leave the two under that radical. So it's two square root of nine. So you will be expected to do that when you have these numbers that are not perfect squares. You are expected to break them down as much as possible to see if you can take the square root of at least part of it. 
So same thing happens if I have the square root of negative 24. I break it up into its factors and use one of the factors that I can take the square root of. In this case, it will be four and six. Now we already talked about using negative and how we can break that up or use that in a representation, a simpler representation. So I will include that negative with the four. So notice I break it up into what I can take the square root of and what I cannot take the square root of. So taking the square root of negative four gives me two i and I leave the six under the radical. Now you can represent this in either one of these ways. Uh, I like to do it this way just because um, now that the, the radical is not extended over the I, uh, but it doesn't matter which way you, you decide to represent. Just, just make sure that you don't extend that radical over the I when you put in your answer or it will mark it wrong. Right. Is it going to matter um, in the uh, math lab what way we do it? Because sometimes they're a little picky. No, it shouldn't matter in this case. Okay. But it will matter if you make a mistake and extend that radical. Like if you don't press the arrow and get from under the uh, radical and put I, it will matter in that case. Yeah. All right. Mr. Tucker? Yes. So is there ever going to be like a time where we'll have like a number that's not um you're not able to find the square root of like if we have like another one like 18 or negative 24 where you have to find two of them and sure. then there's not two numbers that you can't mm -hmm. factor most definitely mm -hmm. uh just like if you just you could have had the square root of 17 there's nothing you could do with that um but if you had the square root of negative 17 then you can at least take the i take okay. the i out Yep. So yeah, that's most definitely possible. And if you put the I like in the whatever that's called, mm -hmm. the square root, would that be wrong? Yes. So yeah. you just have to make sure that you come out of the, you know, hit the arrow button to come out of the radical and then hit then put your eye behind it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep, not a problem. All right. So just looking at this next one, um, I just did another one just to reemphasize the process, square root of 500. Um, and so here, what I was doing is just making sure that we saw that even if you don't pull the largest number out, if you keep breaking it down, you still get to the same answer. So here, square root of 500, the largest number you can factor out is 100, 100 times five, then take the square root of 100, that would be 10 square root of five. But let's say you didn't see 100, but you saw 25. So you break it up into 25 times 20, that's still 500. Simplify that, square root of 25 is going to be five, but you still can break down this 20. You break down the 20 into four times five, square root of four is two, and then five times two still gives you your 10. So I was just here just playing with numbers, um, probably in that class period that I was doing these notes for, they probably ask, you know, if you don't find a large number. So I was just emphasizing the process, that's all. Either way, you'll still, if you do everything correctly, continue to break it down, you still get to your answer. All right. Any other questions before we scroll up? So the next one is complex numbers. Now before, all we dealt with was the imaginary part. Your complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. So it's gonna take on the form of A plus B I. Where in the real part, you would write first, the imaginary part, you would write second. And that's considered being in standard form. So for the most part, they're gonna ask you to write your answer in standard form. So that means the real part, the part that does not, that's not attached to, a, to an I is your real part. That part is written first. Imaginary part is written second. All right. And that they should stay in math lab. And then if you, if you write, let's say for this one, if you were to write five I plus two, it should stay, it should stay right in standard form. And all that means is just switch your numbers. Make sure the real part is first, imaginary part is second.
And so over here, just examples of complex numbers, two plus five I, negative one plus three I, seven minus 10 I. And then the number eight can be written in complex number form if you do eight plus zero I. And the same thing with negative 12 I, if you were to write zero minus 12 I, um, you can still write them as a complex number. All right, body good. So the next exercise is adding and subtracting complex numbers. And so notice uh, the note I put next is all you're doing is combining your like terms. So we have five minus 11i plus seven plus four i. Five plus seven will give you 12. You add your imaginary parts, then you add your uh, add your real parts, excuse me, then you add your imaginary parts. Get negative 11i plus 4i will be negative 7i. All right. Same thing with subtraction. Negative five I minus the quantity of negative 11 minus six I. Why did I say negative five I? Negative five plus I minus negative 11 minus six I. So since we have a minus sign sitting in front of that quantity, first thing we do is distribute the minus sign that changes both of our signs and the follow parentheses. Then from there, we can combine the like terms, negative five plus 11 gives you six, and then I plus six, I, seven, I. Any questions, any questions? All right, so we're erasing the thing and we can just talk through it. Okay, so our original problem here we have 4i times 3 minus 5i. So we're going to multiply um, complex numbers. So the first thing we'll do is distribute the 4i just like we would any other. Um, situation scenario of this nature, you distribute what's sitting in front of the parentheses. So 4i times 3 is 12i. 4i times negative 5i is negative 20i squared. Any problems so far? So now, what we do not want in our final answer is I squared. Okay, so you should never have I squared in your final answer. And so reason being is because of what's going on here in this purple circle. I just wanna bring that down a little further. All right, so we know when we have I, that represents I, uh, square root of negative one. Now, if I were to square that, notice what happens here the square and the square root will cancel and that leaves me with negative one. So whenever you see I squared, that's actually negative one. And that's how we would process it moving forward. Like even if you don't you know, remember the process, remember that I squared is equal to negative one and that's how you're gonna operate moving forward. Okay, I squared simplifies all the way down to negative one. So once again, I squared should never be a part of your final answer. All right, so if I go ahead and place negative one in for I squared, now I have 12I minus 20 times negative one. 
I can simplify that because negative two negative is positive. Now that's plus 20. And then over here in the blue, just emphasizing standard form, real part is first, imaginary part is second. So you will switch spots with the 20 and the 12i, right? The 20 first, 12i second. All right, questions, make sure we're okay. All right, can I scroll up? All right, so next one we have a binomial distribution, seven minus three i times negative two minus five i. So just like before we treat it the same way we would any other scenario that we would have in this case, go to do your binomial, your foil. So seven times negative two, negative 14, seven times negative five, negative 35 i. Negative three i times negative two is positive six i, and then negative three i times negative five is positive 15 i squared. All right, combine your like terms. So two terms in the middle, negative 35 i, positive six i gives us negative 29 i. And once again, I squared is negative one. So it's actually going to be negative 15 for us. So negative 14, negative 15 gives us negative 29. All Any questions? All right, next thing, it's a complex conjugate. So notice the difference between A plus BI and A minus BI is just the middle sign. And so when you talk about complex conjugates, uh, that's all that is different from the two imaginary, uh, two complex numbers. It's just that the imaginary sign is different. Notice the real is still positive. A is positive A, positive A, but the imaginary number has a different sign. So, and they're complex conjugates of each other. So uh, that's why I got arrow going back and forth. So if you have five plus three I, the complex conjugate is five minus three I. If I have negative eight minus 11 I, complex conjugate negative eight plus 11 I. Then if I just had 23 I, and that conjugate would be negative 23i. Remember, it's the imaginary number sign that changes. All right. So that helps us when it comes to the division, whenever we want to divide, or what they call dividing complex numbers. Here we have 3i over 4 plus i. And so we're going to multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So our denominator is 4 plus i. We're going to multiply top and bottom by 4 minus i. That's what I did here. Haven't got to the blue part yet. We got to do the work, but this is where we are right now. Multiplying top and bottom by four minus I. 
So we'll get there in a second. All right, so let's look at the numerator first. 3i times 4 minus i. What are we looking at right here? So you distribute the 3i to each term. 3i times 4 is 12i. And then 3i times negative i is negative 3i squared. Once again, since we have i squared, that turns into negative 1. Mm -hmm. And then negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. So just writing that in standard form will give you positive 3 plus 12i. So before we go to the denominators, everybody okay with the numerator? So now the denominator, 4 plus i times 4 minus i, that's what we're doing right here. So you do your FOIL. Let me erase this. So 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times negative i is negative 4i. i times 4 is 4i. And then i times negative i is that negative i squared. And now you combine your like terms. 4i and negative 4i will cancel in the middle. Also, i squared once again turns into negative 1. So you have 16 minus negative 1. And that'll be plus. And so that gives you 17 as your denominator. And notice what that does for us whenever you multiply complex conjugates, the imaginary part will uh, be eliminated, will cancel out. And that's what you want. You don't want the imaginary part still in your denominator when you talk about dividing. Uh, remember that imaginary i represents the square root. As you remember going back to rationalizing your denominator, you don't want a square root in your denominator for your final answer, if you can help it. And so that's what all of this process does for us. Cancels out the existence of the square root in our denominator. All right, so let's go back up here, up here now. So this is our numerator, 17 is our denominator. Now, when you uh, are dealing with complex numbers, they do not want you to leave it like this. They do want you to break it up. And so that's why you have the 17 going into each part. And even though nothing could, be, could reduce here, you have your real part and you have your imaginary part and that's how they want it. So you could put this into my math lab when dealing with complex numbers and they could tell you rewrite it or write in standard form. That's what they probably would say, write in standard form. Write in the standard form mean you just separate them. And so you have three over 17 plus 12 I over 17, or 12, 12 over 17 I, either way. Can you go back up real quick to the notes right before this? I didn't get that part. Talking about that part or you wanna go further? A little further up. Okay. Let me make sure everybody's done with this. Then I'll scroll up for you. All right. Anybody still copying? Let's scroll up. All right. All right. Let me know where to stop. Right there. Okay. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Not a problem, not a problem. All right. Next thing, I think just the last exercise in this section. So if you have the square root of negative B, that's the same thing as uh, I square root B. You kind of talked about that before when I pulled out that 17 square root of 17. Uh, one of your classmates asked before square root of negative 17. So notice the note, 
before you simplify or calculate, take out the I or take the I out first. And so what do we mean by that? If we have the square root of negative five, 25 times the square root of negative four. Now don't forget whenever you multiply in radicals, you can just multiply what's under the radicals as long as they're the same thing. You know, as long as you're not multiplying square root times Q root. If you multiply two square roots, you can multiply what's under the radical and uh, get your answer. Now, what we're saying though, is if a negative is involved, you cannot do that first. So you have to pull the I out. So in other words, you'll see the difference in answer. If I were to multiply square root of negative 25 times square root of negative four, that'd be the square root of positive 100, which would be 10, but you lose the existence of that negative or that square root of negative. So what you're supposed to do is what we're doing down here, square root of negative 25 times the square root of negative four, pull the I out first. That's I square root of 25, I square root of four. Now, when you multiply I times I is I squared, uh, square root of 100 is negative 10. And notice the answer is negative 10, not positive 10. Also, the other way of doing it, um, if we could take the full square root of that number, which is square root of 25 is five, square root of four is two, you still get your negative 10 because you end up with 10 square root, uh, 10 I squared, uh, which will give you the negative 10. So just showing you two different ways of doing it. But the main thing we have to emphasize is that you have to take out the I if there's a square root of a negative. Uh, you have to take out the I if there's a square root of a negative. All right, scrolling up. All right, so before we go over here, let's look at the red first. So I just want to emphasize what you can add and subtract from each other and what you cannot. So um, when you're looking at radicals and the radican, that's what's under the radical, uh, you have to have the same index of your radical um, and the same thing under the radical if you're going to add. Now, we're not talking about multiplying, we're talking about adding. So we look at this first one. If I have five square root of two plus three square root of two, I can add those together. That'll give me eight square root of two. If anything is different over here, then uh, over here, when you're looking at the square root, then I cannot add them together. So looking at this first, the second one, five square root of two plus three square root of seven. Because I have the square root of two and the square root of seven, I cannot add those together. Okay. In this third one, I have five square root of two and three cute root of two because I have a difference in index here. I cannot add them together. And then, of course, you know, if one has an imaginary part and the other one doesn't, then I cannot add them together. So this is five square root of two, three I square root of two. Cannot add them together. So notice the only one that I could add together was the first one because they both were real and they both had square root and they both had two under the radical. All right, so before we go to our actual problem, is everybody okay with what we can and cannot do when it comes to adding and subtracting? So what would be our answer in like math lab if we were presented with one of those problems that we could not add together? Well, they will give you a problem which you could, and then you would maybe, this is as furthest as you could go. See what I mean? Like you would have other pieces to it and this would be as simple as, as it can get. And that would be your answer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Good question, good question. And I will say this, if for some reason they do give you this and there's nothing you can do with it, there will be an option that says 
cannot simple for, simplify any further or is already in lowest terms, something along those lines. But I don't think they would give you, I think they would give you something that's more than what we have. You would break it down and then it would simplify to this and that would be as further as you can go. That would be your answer. All right, so now looking at this problem, we have the square root of negative 18 minus the square root of negative eight. Now, in its current state, we cannot subtract these two expressions. All right, so what we would do is try to break it down further to see if we can once we finish simplifying it. So looking at the square root of 18, this is my breakdown right here. When I broke 18, square root of 18, square root of negative 18 into nine, negative nine times two, if I can get it out. I broke up the square root of negative 18 into negative nine times two, took the square root of negative nine, which is three I, left the two under the radical. So this is the most simplified way of expressing the square root of negative 18. I did the same thing with the square root of negative eight. I broke that up into negative eight times, negative four times two, take the square root of negative four, which is two i, and I left the two under the radical. All right, any questions with the breakdown? All right. So now here's our new problem. 3i square root of 2 minus 2i square root of 2. And since both of them have i, both of them have a square root, and both of them 2 under the radical, I can go ahead and subtract these. That would be 3i minus 2i, which will give me 1i. And remember here, just write, you know, writing it the, the two different ways that should be OK in math lab. All right, any problems or questions before we look at the next one? All right, so the original problem here, we have negative one plus square root of negative five squared. So remember what we said before, before you do any type of multiplication, distribution, or anything, you have to pull the i out first. And so that's what we did here. I had the square root of negative five. So before I expanded or distributed, I pulled the i from under that radical, pulled the negative from under that radical and represented it as i square root of five. From there, we go ahead and foil. So negative one times negative one is positive one. Negative one times I square root of five. Negative I square root of five. I square root of five times negative one. Negative I square root of five. And then I square root of five times I square root of five is I squared square root of 25. All right. So looking at the breakdown or the, the simplification, we have negative i square root of 20, uh, negative i square root of five minus i square root of five, that will be negative two i square root of five because you have negative i, negative i will give you negative two i. Then here, this i squared turns into negative and then square root of 25 is five. And then we can finish it off. One minus five is negative four.
Any problems, any problems? All right, next one. Looking at negative 25 plus square root of negative 50 over 15. Once again, the first thing we want to address is the square root of the negative. And so that's what I did here. Broke it up into the square root of negative 25 times two. So negative 25 gives you five I, leave you two under the radical. So now we have this as our expression. And you know, I, I mentioned before how if you have a fraction with these this uh, complex number, they do want you to break it up. So that 15 will go into each number which will give us this, negative 25 over 15 plus five I, square root of two over 15. And then from there, you just simplify it down. Uh, there's a five in each one of these terms. It breaks up into negative five over three plus I square root of two over three. So Mr. Tucker, mm -hmm. so for like earlier, I guess we were dividing them and we divided them by the denominator, but you didn't do that this time. Why? Now, when you say, uh, do you remember which one you're talking about? We said dividing them by the denominator. Three I over four plus I. Oh, because it couldn't reduce. Now before, let me go to that one. Um, tell me three, uh, are you talking about this one? Which one you say three yeah. I? Or yeah, this one? Yeah. yeah. Now that's called dividing. Those we still have in our final answer. That's 17 in the denominator. Mm -hmm. um, it, no, our answer is still the same thing. It's just that in this case, we didn't have an imaginary in our denominator. Oh, okay. We just had the number 15. So it was like we didn't need that extra step of multiplying by the conjugate and everything like that. So, okay. uh, yeah, which way you go and how you go about getting to your final answer will always be dictated according to uh, what you initially given. And so that, that's what was the difference in this problem. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Or anything I've written out of 1.4? So as always, make sure you try the stuff out, you know, see if you have any questions. Um, that'll probably be the real indicator on which if you really do or not, it might be, you know, you might be good. You might be all right. You might be all right. All right. I scroll up. It's 841. So, okay, so we'll touch on one, one five. We're not gonna finish it for sure. But um please get started. All right, so looking at 1.5 quadratic equations, the general form of our quadratic equation, ax squared plus, four, uh, plus bx plus c equals zero, is a second degree polynomial. It means the highest exponent on our variable is two. And that means we should get two solutions. Unless there's a repeated solution, that means we just got the same solution twice, but you still should get your two solutions. All right. So this section is going to talk about four different ways to solve. Was, was that for me? Are you saying? Oh, sorry. I thought I was still on mute. I'm oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just making sure you, you weren't asking me something. <laughs> so we have four uh, different methods to solve. Uh, the zero factor property, the square root property, 
uh, completing the square and the quadratic formula. We talk about all four of those methods in this section. Now this first method, zero factor property, leans on your ability to factor. So once again, um, you know, if you have some uh, factoring holes, you know, make sure you get with me. See what I can do to help you out there. So let's look at the first method. Zero factor property. It just says if A times B is equal to zero, then A is equal to zero, B is equal to zero, or both. So basically, you want to get your quadratic equation into this form. Notice in the blue I wrote it's already factored. You want it to be into the form of your uh, factored as much as possible. Notice we have our parentheses, x plus five, x plus two. Once you factored it, then all it's saying is that now you can set each part equal to zero and then solve for x to get your solutions. So um, once you've factored your expression, x plus five equals zero, will give you x equal to negative five and then x plus two equals zero, will give you x equal to negative two. So that will be your goal. You have your equation. We want to factor it as much as possible and set each piece equal to zero to solve. So here we have 4x squared minus 2x equal to zero. So we have this scenario, if you want to use zero factor property, you want to factor as much as possible. And so what I did here was I factored out 2x from each term. And that gave me 2x times 2x minus one equal to zero. So then from there, setting each part equal to zero, I have two x equal to zero, two x minus one equal to zero. And then to solve for the first one, you divide both sides by two, solve the next one, you add one to both sides. Divided by two gives you x equal to zero. Adding one to both sides gives you two x equal to one, then divide by two, x is equal to one half. So those would be your two solutions. Excuse me. The next one, 2x squared plus 7x equal to 4. So remember, it's called a zero factor property. So uh, you do need to set one side equal to zero before you factor. So we subtract 4 from both sides. That'll give us 2x squared plus 7x minus 4 equal to 0.
All right, then we factor the trinomial. So if you uh, go back to your factoring skills, that since this back sign is negative, both our signs need to be different. Factors of twos is one and two, so that's why we have one X and two X. Then as far as the back is concerned, only choice is one times four and two times two, and the one that worked for us is one and four. So don't forget, whatever my factorization is, it's supposed to be multiplied back out to give me what I originally had. If that does not occur, then that's not the correct factorization. So you can always go back and check your factorization that way. And, um, you know, so once again, you know, we have four methods in this section, so it's not really focusing on factoring. So if you do need help uh, with uh, factoring or whatever, make sure you get with me so I can make sure you're good moving forward. But once you factor it completely, 2x minus 1 is equal to 0, x plus 4 equals 0, so each part equals 0. And um, solve for x, you get 1 half and negative 4. Questions, questions, questions. All right, next one we have x squared minus 13x plus 36 equals zero. Once again, we want to factor it. Uh, this time we only have x in the front, so it's just x times x. All right, and then both of our signs are going to be minus signs because we have this plus back here, let's know they should be the same. And the front one tells us which one they're going to be, so both of them should be minus. Now we're looking at factors of 36 that will add together to give you 13. And we look at the factors of 36 over here, just four and nine. And so that's why we have x minus four and x minus nine. Set each part equal to zero and x is equal to four and x equal to nine for our solutions. Also remember, you can always check that by plugging it back into your original equation as well, whatever you're calling your solutions. questions mr tucker mm -hmm. so in high school and stuff they told us they taught us to do um like to find numbers that add up to negative 13 but multiplied equals 36 mm -hmm. when we're factoring to help us factoring is that still the case and does it yeah. apply yeah that's fine mm -hmm. okay. yeah, you can use that method most definitely yeah, because if you're talking about two numbers that add together and multiply, that would be the four and the nine. And that works for you here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, not a problem. All right, so next one, nine X squared plus nine X equal to negative two. Uh, I want to set one side equal to zero. So we'll add two to both sides. And that'll give us 9x squared plus 9x plus 2 equal to 0. I think I tried. Yep, OK. Yep. And so um, you know our signs have to be the same. And the positive time, sign let us know that that's what's going to be the case. So both of our signs are going to be positive. And so now you're looking at what factors of nine to use. We have one times nine and three times three. 
in the back, we only have two. So it's just one times two. So I was just emphasizing here, you know, if you didn't see that it was three times three, when you tried one times nine, when you multiply it back out, it would not give you what you originally had. So when you talk about factoring, um, you can always check it by just pulling this back out and see if you get what you originally had. And so if you were to put one and nine here and here, you will not get, well, where are we at? Yeah, we'll not get this expression right here. So three and three is the only thing that's going to work. So three X plus one and three X plus two will be the only thing that gives you that original expression. So once you've established that that is your factorization, You can go to set each piece equal to zero. You can solve. First one, we'll subtract one from both sides. Second one, we'll subtract two from both sides. Then in both cases, we divide by three. And that gives us the solution of negative one third and then negative two over three. All right, questions, any questions? So you scroll up, okay, I did save that one from the slides. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, we can start right here. So this is a good place to stop. Uh, next class, we'll look at the other three of uh, three methods in this section. I'm trying to see how far this goes. How far to get? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so next class, we'll look at the other three method methods, and then I'll go from there. Any questions before we close? For good or straight? Okay, so you guys have a good one. Be safe, and I will see you on next class. Have a great day, Mr. Gregory. Thanks. Thanks. Take care, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.